Dr. Atchison here talking about Chapter 6, Perceiving Depth, and we're on our last section where we're going to talk about integrating those depth cues, um, and we're going to talk about some illusions. So what happens when we have multiple depth cues present? So we've talked about a little bit, and you've hear, heard me hint that there's some overlap between um, some of these depth cues, both the monocular, the monocular um, cues and some of the binocular cues, that there's some overlap there. The visual system really relies on all of this information to help determine depth and distance. So it's not one or the other, it's all of it together. And this redundancy is really a good thing um, because it's such an important task. So the more information they have, the more the visual system, more information the visual system has to go on and it can make better decisions. The research findings suggest there are several principles that depth cues, that integration of these depth cues operate under. The first is that not none of these depth cues, not one of them, dominates all situations. Um, so no, si and no single cue is necessary in all si situations. Partial occlusion is the closest we have to always being dominant, but still, even partial occlusion is not all dominant in all situations. The more depth cues that are present, the greater the likelihood will perceive the scene in depth and the greater the accuracy and the consistency of the depth perception. So this is the better the input, the better the output. So the more input we have, the better information the visual system has to make decisions about depth um, and decisions about distance and decisions about perception. Um, so really the more cues that are present, the better. And because these depth cues give us different kinds of information, they help us to co construct a really accurate view of the layout of the scene. Because they're all providing a different piece of the puzzle, we're able to get a really good image of what um, the depth scene really looks like. And this is done really, really rapidly. Um, it's automatic um, and it occurs without conscious thought. Um, so all of these things we talked about, um, you're not consciously saying, oh, I'm going to integrate these things. This is all happening on that unconscious level that in, in terms of dual level processing, that unconscious level. So there are some definitely some perceptual consistencies, um, and these really help us um, in terms of this depth. We have size con um, constancy, um, and this is the idea that no matter how far away an object is, it's not changing size. So just because the object's far away doesn't mean it's smaller, it just means it's farther away. Um, so if we didn't have this, we would perceive that the object shape would change um, when the depth perception changed. So here's an example of this um, size constancy just because those blue columns are further down the hall, I don't think that they've built this hall and made the blue columns at the end a different size than the blue columns at the front. Um, I think they're the same size because I have size constancy. Size, distance, and variance. Um, this is that relationship between the size and the perceived distance. Um, and vice versa. So again, when we're looking at this hallway with these blue discs, um, I'm going to infer distance um, because of the differences in the size. And I'm also going to um, infer um, information about the object size because of its distance. So again, it's going back and forth. We're both getting information about object si size because of its distance, but we're also getting information about distance because of the object size. Emirates law is um, this idea is an issue of um, size, distance, and variance, um, and it's for those retinal after images. So remember when we looked at the green American flag and we got the retinal after image? We're going to do that too, um, but it's going to show you how size distance can still play a role in these after images. So I'm going to give you an image to look at, um, and then I want you to look at a piece of white paper, and then I want you to look at kind of a white or a light colored wall. And notice the difference in the retinal image, okay? So here, let's look at this image for a second. Look straight at that red dot and don't move your eyes. Give you about 15 seconds. Again, the longer you look at this, the bigger the after image would be. So if you want to pause this and make it more dramatic, knock yourself out. Okay, so now look at a white piece of paper or a wall, and you should see a green dot. That's that green after image. What you're going to notice, though, is when you look at the white piece of paper that's close to you, um, that that image seems bigger. That green dot seems bigger than if you look at the wall that's farther away. Um, this is, again, that Emmett's Law that there's differences in um, our perception, even though the retinal images are, of course, just the same. 
So if we didn't have this constancy, um, it really would cause problems. Um, again, we have the shape constancy. We have this um, this other one. We talked we talked about shape constancy. We also have shape slant constant invariance. Um, this is the idea that objects don't change shape um, just because they're at different depths um, and different perceptions. So when we open a door, um, that object changes shape on your retinal um, your retinal image changes shape, even though the object doesn't change shape. We don't think that object changed shape um, depending on the slant. So we still perceive the object um, as the same size and the same shape regardless of the slant. Here's another example of that. Um, we have the object um, slanted in different ways. We have the actual object shape stays the same. And we see that the differences in retinal image. Now, just because those go in different directions and just because our retinal image is different, because we have shape slant invariance, we're going to perceive that as still having the same shape. Okay, so we are done with the um, different cues and integrating the cues. Um, let's go through some illusions. So here's the first one. This is the Ames room. You can see two people throwing a basketball and then they change places. We see very different heights. We see people walking back and forth. And it appears that the people, um, when they walk towards the door um, on the left, that they're getting taller. And when they walk towards the door on the right, that they're getting shorter. Um, what's really going on is this is a trapezoidal room. Um, and everything in this room is a trapezoid. But because your visual system always wants to go to this, that question or the answer that makes the most sense, um, when it's viewed from this one particular angle, it actually looks like a square. Um, and so it looks like these people are changing size um, when it really is just your the, the illusion that it's presented at. There's some fun launch pad assignments on the Ponzo and the tabletop illusions that I want you to do so you can go through those. Um, and we'll wrap up talking about the moon illusion. Have you ever gone out on a clear night, looked to the horizon, only to notice a gigantic moon staring back at you? Surely this is the biggest you've ever seen it. Maybe it's just closer to the Earth today? But what if I told you that that moon is the exact same size as every other time you've ever seen it in the sky, and it was in fact playing a trick on your brain? It's called the moon illusion, though an explanation of this optical phenomenon is still debated. What we do know is that when the moon sits closer to the horizon, it seems bigger, but if we measure it in the sky, it's the same size. You can test this by holding your thumbnail at arm's length and comparing it to the size of the moon. Do this when the moon is near the horizon and high in the sky, and you'll notice it doesn't change size. So why does our brain process it so differently? The main theory suggests that when the moon is near the horizon, there are many visual reference points, trees, buildings, mountains, with which its size may be compared. But when the moon resides high in the sky, there's nothing around it to compare, and it seems smaller against the vastness of the night sky. It's similar to an effect known as the Ebbinghaus illusion. Which of these orange circles is larger? It turns out they're the exact same size, but the objects surrounding them have an effect on our brain. The small circles are comparable to the horizon moon with smaller objects in sight, while the large circles are comparable to the high moon surrounded by vast night sky. Furthermore, our brains are used to objects moving towards the horizon becoming smaller, like clouds. So when our brain sees the moon at the horizon appearing the same size in our retina, it compensates for perspective and assumes it must now be physically larger. Still not convinced? Try bending over and looking through your legs at the horizon moon. The effect is gone because upside down trees and buildings don't register as familiar objects and your depth perception isn't confounded. Or for the less flexible, take a photo of both moons. Your camera won't suffer any optical illusions and you can clearly see the moon is the same size. Got a burning question you want answered? Ask it in the comments or on Facebook and Twitter and subscribe for more weekly science videos. Okay, so you heard them talk about the moon illusion. What's interesting is most of these illusions are playing on different kinds of things. Um, so this one's playing on um, some information about relative height. It's playing on some information about um, the size constancy. Um, all of these different things are playing in to these different illusions. So that wraps up our conversation about depth perception. Thanks.